We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, formerly with the New York Times and, and frankly, uh, dozens of papers. Uh, that may be a slight exaggeration, but not a huge one, I don't think. Uh, currently a columnist for the Daily Beast, author of his latest, The Making of Donald Trump. Uh, David, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Five big papers of which uh, the uh, Phil, the uh, New York Times and the L.A. Times were half or 25 of the 40 years I spent at big newspapers. So um, and and you've spent a I mean, decades reporting on Donald Trump. So let me ask you just sort of start with this is sort of broad question. Yeah. Uh, did you ever think that a he would ultimately run for president or b that he would ultimately be this close to being president? Well, on the first one, I mean, Donald's been talking about being president since 1985. He asked George H.W. Bush to make him his running mate instead of Dan Quayle in 1988. Um, I'm not sure Donald can spell potato any better than Dan Quayle. Uh, he ran in 2000 on a fringe party ticket and boasted that I'll be the first candidate for president to turn a profit off of my campaign. And, uh, you know, he's in 2012. He said he was running and then he dropped out. Um, so I'm not surprised at all. Um, but I mean, I mean, seriously home. doing it like, you know, Pat Paulson ran well, for president, too. Right. right. No, this time around, when he announced in June of 2015, I immediately and I was the only national journalist who said this. He is serious this time. And the reason he was serious was Donald was in danger of having his show canceled by NBC. And if you're Donald Trump, short of dying, the worst thing that can happen to you is for the, the tabloids, the Post and the Daily News, to have the same cover. NBC to Trump, you're fired. And so I figured he was running long enough to demonstrate he had a bigger audience, could get a bigger, better, and different TV deal, because his show was getting pretty long in the tooth. But I also said he might get the nomination, because with so many candidates and yeah. with no clear leader, he could pick people off. Um, Donald doesn't want to do the duties of being president. He doesn't have any policy objectives. His policy objective isn't. And Sam, I, I don't understand why you don't appreciate this. Donald is the leading person of the world, and and you should recognize that. And it, and if you don't, Donald has a word for you, Sam. Loser. Loser. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, believe me. Uh, believe me. I know it's true. Uh, but wait. Well, so let me ask you this: Do you think? Um, so at one point over the course of, uh, do you think at any time during this that he has been saying to himself, like, I actually want to be president or, or uh, let me, uh, let me rephrase that. Has he been a hundred percent committed to actually doing the job? Because I, I agree with you. My sense is he entered the race because, uh, you had so many candidates that he calculated like. I can't lose because there's too many people in the race for there to be a loser. Uh, there's just going to be the person who doesn't win. He's going to benefit from it from a marketing standpoint. Obviously, at one point, he starts to realize, like, holy cow, I'm having fun doing this. I fly in my jet. I do this once a week. People really love me. And then I fly out. But at one point, too, I imagine he's, you know, had that Ross Perot moment where he's like, hey, wait a second. I may actually have to be president. Uh, do you think that, do you, I mean, how much... Does he really care about losing the presidency at this point? I mean, or not being president? Oh, Donald wants to win. And, and anybody out there who thinks that he, because he's doing so badly in the polls right now, he's going to lose. Man, you're going to be in for a real surprise in November. This guy may still get elected. And there's a long time between now and that election. And there are enormous number of people who believe, cra I mean, nor seemingly normal people I've talked with. You know, I've had all sorts of people tell me, H how don't you understand that Hillary has had all these people murdered? Right. That she has hitmen who kill people? It's like, what? Um, so uh, Donald, um, Donald doesn't understand what the job is. Donald, if you listen to him, doesn't understand the Constitution. He thinks the President of the United States is a dictator. And one of the things I've said repeatedly, Sam, is, if they would have me as one of the questioners, if me and Hugh Hewitt doing the questions, you'd get a really good debate because between the two of us, and we're very different people, we would ask the questions that would be illuminating. But, of course, the candidates get to veto who questions them. 
Right. The President of the United States doesn't get to say, I don't want to deal with uh, the, the dictator in North, in, in North Korea. I don't want to deal with the Speaker of the House. He doesn't get to do that. And they shouldn't get to pick their questioners either. I've got three questions for Donald, simple, basic questions that I'm confident he cannot answer. And I've got three tough questions for Hillary, and I'm not sure she can answer all of them. Uh, uh, but, you know, after the election, I'll, re- I'll reveal them. Oh, all right. I was going to ask you. That was actually going to be my next question. One oh, thing no, I'm not going to tell you, because I might, maybe there's a one in a million chance I will get to ask him. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. If they, end up, if they end up choosing me by some uh, uh, hook or crook, I'll I will. I'll give you the question. All right. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, you know, one thing, actually, you, you raised that Hugh Hewitt thing, and, I, and I, I've heard you talk about uh, uh, Trump's answer to Hugh Hewitt about the triad. And what I didn't know was that Hugh Hewitt had actually asked him that question before, on his radio program six months earlier. So, so four months earlier, yeah. Yeah, so this was like a total gimme, and Trump obviously got off that interview with uh, Hugh Hewitt and never thought about it again. Yeah, uh, that's part of what you have to understand about Donald. Uh, when I say Donald doesn't know anything, I mean that, and since you've read the book, you know that I cite examples of where he has asked questions under oath. Now, I teach one day a week in the law school and the graduate business school at Syracuse. My students could answer the questions that Donald gives gibberish responses to. And uh, as, as I, I say that you know, any grammar school kid knows that 2 plus 2 equals 4, and anybody who is a one of the super genius business school and is a super genius business person should be able to answer a particular one of these questions, and Donald can't. Donald well, it is seems willful. A couple of things, but he doesn't have any knowledge to be president. But it seems willful. I mean, it almost seems like it's not just a question of him not like picking up a, a book and reading anything. It seems like he's. It is. He is fundamentally again. Like he he almost sees it as problematic to be weighed down by by knowledge. Um, yeah, I think that's. Uh... That's exactly true. Uh, uh, Donald Don has no curiosity. He doesn't know anything. And his whole life, like a, most con artists, he's gotten away with just blustering. You know, you ask him, uh, nobody reads the Bible more than Donald Trump. What's your favorite passage? Well, there's so many. There's just, there's so many, you know, you, uh, you, there's so many. And that tells you, he doesn't read the Bible. Let, I, I, let me ask you some specifics about the uh, that, that that came up in the book because there's uh, there's stuff here that um, I imagine if people went you know uh, I, I, a lot uh, so a lot of this stuff I didn't know and I you know I, I it's it's it gives you a better sense of of this guy there was one thing that stuck out for me that was sort of like a personal. Um, well, back in my days as a filmmaker, uh, I would make comedy films, and I actually took out an award, uh, a, 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 an ad in Variety <laughs> when my movie went to the um, uh, HBO uh, Aspen comedy uh, thing called the Black Diamond Award, and it was a fake award uh, that I made up, and I just bought an ad in, in Variety to congratulate me, and it really was incredibly effective. I mean, if you look at the reviews of that movie, they cite the winning of that award, and uh, but Donald Trump, I guess, had done that, right? He, he created Diamond Awards for himself. Tell yeah. us about that story. There, there are at least 19 Trump properties, golf courses, hotels, restaurants, that have on the wall five diamond or six diamond awards, which are said right on the, the guy who gives them out, the most prestigious award in the world. Not, not the most prestigious travel business award, the most prestigious award in the world. These awards are a little business run by a guy named Joey No Socks, who is a mob associate, uh, convicted art theft, art thief. And the board of this little phony group uh, is dominated by Donald Trump and his children. Donald says, I've never been to a board meeting. I'm sure he hasn't. Uh, There are no board meetings. But the awards themselves are signed by Joey Nosox and Donald Trump. He gives (laughs) awards to himself. It's, uh, I got to say, we, uh, people can Google who's the caboose right now, and you will find winner of the prestigious Black Diamond Award. It works. Uh, it works. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's well, and Sam, here's, you know, my eight children when they were little, some of them had imaginary friends when they were like three or four. Yeah. Um, 
This is a grown man. He makes up awards for himself. He puts he plants news stories that beautiful women are pounding on his bedroom door because he wants you to all think he is the great, you know, Lothario of our age. Um, uh, he, th- he wants everybody to think he's the modern Midas, even though much of what he touches turns to dross. It's all a con. It is. Uh, it, it, it is. It is uh, amazing. I mean, to, to to see it all in one uh, place like this is uh, it, it is it, it's amazing. I mean, the I, I, well, that's I, what I want to do was to connect the dots because you know this is what happens sometimes when George Bush ran for president. I wanted to go vet him, and the New York Times had other people doing it, and uh, they weren't investigative reporters. And when they finally did let me go vet him, they said, "Well, everything here was published somewhere, so we're not going to do the story." But nobody had connected the dots. I mean, how many people know that George Bush's fortune derives from a tax increase that he arranged to funnel into his pocket? Um, and and with Donald, it, my book is every, – almost everything in my book is stuff that's been printed elsewhere. That's why there's 44 pages of notes. But nobody's ever drawn them together and connected the dots and said, look how these things all fit into a piece to understand who he is. And that's – for Donald, that's real troublesome because – his whole image is built on you knowing what he wants you to know. There's, there's, t- there's, there, there's sort of like, um, th- well, there's, there's a couple of like uh, uh, stories that I want to get to, but uh, before we get to that, tell us about. I mean, what one of the things that I think really sort of is um, uh, is really striking, and I think uh, you know we've mentioned it on this program at least to a certain extent. We spoke to Wayne Barrett a little bit, and 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 mm-hmm. he had done a lot of all, also of this reporting, oh. but. Um, Tell us about. I'm particularly interested in his his mob connections, like with uh, Felix Sater and with uh, Joseph uh, Weichelbaum. I don't know right. if he's uh, I mean, just give us the uh, the full Monty in that sure. regard. Don, Donald's entire life, he has done business often unnecessarily and gratuitously with mobsters, mob associates, con artists, swindlers, Russian mobsters. Um, Donald's father had a business partner. His business partner was a a guy who was an associate of the Gambino and Genovese families named Willie Tomasello, and there's plenty of law enforcement reports about Willie Tomasello. Donald, by the way, is now going and saying, don't trust the liberal media. None of that's true about my dad. None of it. None of it. Um, You know, who are you going to believe, uh, the law enforcement records or Donald Trump? Um, So Donald, uh, when he came to New York to Manhattan as a young man, made a beeline to connect up with Roy Cohn, the notorious Roy Cohn, lawyer for Senator Joseph McCarthy. And Cohn's clients included the heads of the Gambino and Genovese families and lots of other awful people. And through him, Donald got labor peace because they controlled the unions. He got away with putting non-union guys on union work sites. And when there was a concrete strike, well, Trump Tower, a concrete building, was being built. Every place in the city, the concrete flow stopped except one, Mm. Donald Trump's Trump Tower. Donald, in recent years, has done business with a guy named Felix Sater. Now, he um, told a reporter, I think it was the AP, I wouldn't recognize the guy if you're in the room. I hardly know him. Well, they were together in uh, Colorado, in two cities, in Phoenix, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, in New York City. There are plenty of photographs and videotapes of them. They were investors together. Uh, Sater is a violent convicted felon who took the uh, broken stem of a margarita, margarita glass and punched, pushed it into a guy's face so badly that it took 110 stitches and he'll never be right. He ran a $40 million stock swindle that involved four of the crime families in New York. And Donald continued to business with him. Joe Wexelbaum, mob associate, supplied Donald with his helicopters. Now, there are lots of companies that you can get helicopters, both for yourself, as Donald did, and for his, the casinos. But Donald chose this guy. And after he was indicted as the head of a major cocaine and marijuana trafficking ring, and the indictment says, and he's pled guilty, that he actually physically handled the drugs. You know, Joe Bonanno used to always say, the newspapers say that I am in the heroin business. I've never seen heroin. And of course, the chairman of the board of Exxon's never pumped gasoline either. Right. Um, the uh, uh, Joe Exxon gets indicted. Donald doesn't separate himself from this guy. The somehow mysteriously Joe Exelbaum's case gets moved from Cincinnati, Ohio. It only involves Ohio and Florida. It gets moved to New Jersey. And who does it come before? 
Judge Marianne Trump Berry, Donald's sister. Now, she removed herself from the case, Sam, as she's required to do, but imagine the conversation. She had to go explain. The reason I can't handle this case is I, a federal judge, fly in this drug traffickers helicopters my husband who works for donald trump's casino business is a lawyer he flies in them all the time you're the chief federal judge in new jersey and you've got a judge flying in helicopters owned by a guy who's who's going to confess to being a major drug trafficker well the little fish in that case they got up to 20 years just for delivering the drugs and what did this guy get he spent 18 months in the clink and then he moved into a multi-million dollar apartment in trump tower in Trump Tower. Yeah. Now, and Donald wrote a letter. Oh, I almost forgot the best part. Donald wrote a letter pleading for mercy because this is a stand-up guy. And he first denied that he wrote the letter when he was questioned under oath about it. And then when he was shown the letter, he says, yeah, well, that's my signature. And that was, was dropped. That was the end of it. Now, contrast this with when his father died, there were five Trump children, but one right. died, Fred Trump Jr., they were cut out of the will for all practical purposes. They went and sued, saying undue influence. You know, you, you guys wanted to carve the pie up four ways instead of five. There was a sickly, his nephew, Fred Trump III, had a sickly child who almost died several times in the first year or so, $300,000 in medical bills. This is 16 years ago. This is Trump's, and just like to be all, clear, this to be clear, this is Trump's grandnephew. John, this, Trump's grandnephew. So here's this terribly sickly child. All Trump family members get medical insurance through the company. One of the good things about Donald is he believes in we should all have universal health care, all right? And they get very good health insurance. Well, the minute the lawsuit was filed, Donald cut him off. And when he was asked, well, you know, there's a sickly infant here. You're putting the kid's life in jeopardy. Donald says, well, we lost him. Hold on for one second, folks. What happened there? The home of David. Jennifer Leonard and David K. Johnston. Uh-oh. We're not here right now. It may uh, be quick. Uh, oh, shoot. He doesn't realize. Just, uh... Give us one second, folks. Hi there. When did we lose it? Uh, we lost it right, uh, right at when they asked Donald Trump about um, how can you cut off this okay. sick infant. I, I'm fine. I, I'll pick it up right there. Ready? Yeah. So when Donald is asked, how can you cut off the insurance and put the life of this baby at, in, in jeopardy, Donald goes, well, I don't like people who sue my father's estate. And then he's asked, well, don't you think this will look cold-hearted? And Donald says, well, what else am I to do? I mean, this is a man who has no regard for the welfare of this little child, and yet he goes to bat for a major cocaine trafficker. What else do you need to know about his fitness to be the president of the United States? I don't need to know much else, but I am curious <laughs> as to why, uh, as to what it was that he was, whether it was just out of the goodness of his heart that he was supporting this, this, um, this, you know, um, otherwise very sweet, nice cocaine trafficker, uh, or was it just that maybe it wasn't just uh, helicopter services that Donald Trump was so, getting from this guy? What? So what I, what I say about that, Sam, in the making of Donald Trump is this. We don't know what motivated Donald. Here's what we do know. Donald was a, could have lost his casino license over continuing to use this guy's helicopters and continuing to associate with him and writing a letter seeking mercy for him and initially denying he'd written such a letter. He could, that casino license, it was unbelievably valuable to him. He could have lost it. What would motivate Donald Trump to do this? Well, the only thing we do know is this. His actions show that Donald needed Joey Wechselbaum, mob associate and drug drug trafficker, to be his friend and not his enemy. There's something he knew that Donald would risk his casino license because this guy, if he turned into his enemy, it was going to be a lot worse for Donald. Uh, Donald, I want to point out, does not use drugs. He does not drink. Donald is an investor, and I think the reasonable question to ask is, 
Were you putting money in the drug deals? And of course, Donald would deny that. But had they pursued this case, surely that would have been the principal question that would have been asked. Were you financing Joey Wexelbaum? And there's some other things that are in the book that, you know, raise questions about the financial relationship between Donald Trump and Joey Wexelbaum. They've never been explored. Didn't, didn't he call you after you had reported on this at one point? Was it, was it after? Well, what this? happened is, I mean, Donald and I have known each other for almost 30 years. He's had my home number for forever. And uh, Donald uh, called me April 27th when I was doing a piece for Politico magazine. And all it did was put together the record of all, there's no, no news in it except drawing everything together about his connections to all these mob guys and, and swindlers. And uh, Donald uh, told me, you know, you've written a lot of things I really liked. They were terrific, Dave, but, um, you know, if I don't like what you write, I'm going to sue you. Now, Donald's been doing this to everybody. One of the reasons people keep saying, why is the news organizations, why are they being so soft on him? He's made it clear he'll sue everybody in sight. He said that publicly. We're going to sue these people and get rich. We're going to change the laws and go after these lying liberal journalists. And, you know, if Donald sues me, he sues me. I mean, you know, the, 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 the equivalent of my wilting in front of his threat would be a police officer who sees gunplay and runs the other direction. Right. And, and you know, I'm a guy who's run into a burning building and personally... Um, you know, hunted down, I know some people won't like that term, but hunted down a vicious murderer and confronted him and got an innocent man freed from prison as a result. You do what you need to do. But he's intimidated organizations. The piece I wrote for Politico, Sam, well, it broke no news. In my almost 50 years of investigative reporting, it was the most heavily lawyered piece of my career, which tells me that Donald or his surrogates have made it clear to these news organizations that, you know, you don't go there. Interesting. And, and, you know, they can't win. You know, Donald can't win a lawsuit, but he could cost you tens of millions of dollars in litigation fees. Right. I mean, we've seen we've seen this uh, we've seen this play out, I guess, with um, Peter Thiel and, 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 and Gawker and 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 O'Brien, who wrote, wrote a, uh, a a book about Donald. Um, right. Right. Uh, I mean, do you think? I mean, I, I know you feel that the that 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 because of that, the uh, media outlets have have taken it easy on Trump. I mean, do you think that was? Uh, I mean, do you think it's do you think it's just easier on some level for them to say like he is sad, he 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 uh, said that Obama founded ISIS or he uh, threatened to. Uh, or, or, you know, encourage people to assassinate Hillary Clinton is just an right. easier story to, I guess, uh, report on than sort of the intricacies oh, yeah. of his of his tax uh, his tax forms. Fundamental of journalism in America. Most journalists, and we need this, accurately tell you the official version of events, what somebody said, the president of a company, a senator, uh, the secretary of state, and they then go and get the official criticisms of that. But they're talking about what people say. I'm not in that business. I cover what politicians and businesses do. That's a really difficult, different business. You have to understand the law and economics and regulation, things I teach at Syracuse University in the graduate school and, the, uh, and in the law school. And you have to know where to find documents and you have to know how to make sense out of them. But I don't think there's any excuse for the coverage of Donald Trump where – he says something, a smart reporter like Katie Tour at NBC and MSNBC will say, you know, uh, you really mean you want the Russians to, to hack into emails? And Donald doubles down. And then she says, doesn't that give you pause? And Donald triples down. Then the next day, after other people have said, Donald, you realize what you just did, he then says, oh, I was being sarcastic. Go look at the news reports. They're all about how Donald says he was being sarcastic. They ignore that Katie Tour did what you're supposed to do. She nailed him down on that. And that's part of the problem. The coverage here is awful. And the reasons for that are simple. One of the fastest disappearing jobs in America is journalists, and news organizations have nothing revenues today. The New York Times had a billion dollars of ads in, I think it was 95 or 6 or 7. And today their total revenues adjusted for inflation are about a third of that. Wow. They don't have the money to do this stuff right. I mean, so where do we uh, where do we go from here? I mean, I, I, I'm not even talking in terms of, of Donald Trump, but 
But uh, from a, a media and journalism perspective, I mean, the, the, the Times, I guess, announced the other day, too, that they, they were no longer going to do more or less local reporting. Like, you know, we're not going to cover Albany, uh, you know, in any sort of um, uh, specific way. Albany, you know, for people outside of, uh, of New York State is, is our capital, and it's an incredibly corrupt uh, we have an incredibly corrupt is state it? state uh, government uh, in this in this state, um, right. where I don't know half of the not half three quarters of the the leadership of I the think leadership? is in jail right now. Um, yeah, and, and, I mean, so where does that where does that leave us? I mean, when, I, I think I think that what this election is bringing for a couple of things, Sam. One of them is that our democracy is in really serious deep trouble that turning politics from parties into the personal is having terrible effects, and television is contributing a lot to this, that the decades of very well-funded attacks on honest journalism, uh, people have those bumper stickers, don't trust the liberal media, right? We're going to trust Fox News where it's well-documented, they lie all the time. Um, the, the weakness, the financial weakness of news organizations all of these are contributing to really fundamental danger. And now you have Donald Trump coming along promoting violence. And there will be more violence. And it, it's, it's not just, by the way, people with Trump. A man here in upstate New York, where I live, I'm in Rochester, New York, uh, wearing a Trump T-shirt was beaten with a crowbar the other day. Oh, Once you unleash these forces, all sorts of things happen. And Trump, when confronted with, you know, you don't even – go within 100 miles of hinting at your opponent being assassinated, um, he, he says, oh, it was all misunderstanding. Well, yeah, you and I could say, okay, fine, you spotted brutally. But there are plenty of, of deranged and zealous people. I mean, let's remember you were on MSNBC last night, and I think you guys discussed the guy who murdered Itzhak Rabin. Mm-hmm said, I'm not crazy. I want everyone to know he was, he was the devil, and it was my duty to kill him. And there are people out there who certainly think Hillary Clinton's the devil. Donald Trump told him she's the devil. Right. Well, amongst others. This is, I this mean, is frankly, very right? Our democracy is in big trouble, Sam, and we need to recognize it. And we need to stop having you know, people like Paul Ryan, who is a public servant. You and I just don't see the world the way he does. They need to do more than what they're doing. They need to really step up to the plate and recognize what's going on because of this campaign. Do you think the media is holding people like that account to account? Because here's what I think is going to happen. You know, I mean, it, what we saw from Paul Ryan, who got up there the other day, I thought was one of the single most cowardly acts in uh, public life that we've seen. I don't know. Maybe uh, there's been a lot of them, but uh, uh, frankly, but but in recent memory, I thought that j that performance was just unbelievably cowardly uh, for someone who is the Speaker of the House. And I mean, but 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 I I am quite sure that come January of 2016 or February of 2016 or let's 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 project even into like April of 20 uh, 2017 rather um, that all of that there's going to be no accountability for for the Republican leadership they're all going to disavow Trump maybe it'll happen like uh, you know in the second week of October when when the polls are uh, way out of kilter, or they'll do it on, on November 9th. They'll say, you know, I'm glad he lost, and, and all will be forgiven. There'll be no, that, that, that none of this accrues to, uh, to someone like Paul Ryan. And frankly, you know, I mean, we had a, we had a similar conversation last night uh, on, on that Hayes, same Hayes program about um, the, the Clinton campaign putting out a press release uh, crowing about John Negroponte uh, endorsing her. Like, if there's no, if there is no official or media or just no broad acceptance of like, hey, you don't brag about a John Negroponte because he was involved in some some pretty heinous right. stuff. I mean, obviously, we're not going to go back and we're not going to try people who are involved in these things. It's just not going to happen. But there should be some measure of a societal uh, circuit breaker that says, like, you're going to pay some minor price so that you don't have a legacy that so that it sends a message to people in the future. Like, yeah. this is just not appropriate behavior. It, Sam, if if you're Paul Ryan, who was the head of the Republican Party until a couple of weeks ago, um, I understand that you have to think about the institution of the party. 
And I understand that if you were one of the candidates and you said, I will support the candidate, all you have to do is say, I support Donald Trump, and then go sit on your hands and do nothing. You've now fulfilled your obligation. You don't have to do anything more than that. I don't think you have to attack him. But when he starts going outside of the boundaries of civil democratic society, when he says, well, beat the guy up or whatever he was he said about the guy in the crowd, I'll pay your legal bills. Not that he ever would. He wouldn't. Um, he's inciting people to use non voting ballot methods. He is proposing, uh, I would argue you could make a case that he is proposing treasonous action and revolutionary action. If you want to be a revolutionary against the United States government, go right ahead. Don't be surprised if you lose that we shoot you. Uh, we imprison you at a minimum. And that's what Donald Trump is doing because he has no understanding of the political process. He has no understanding of peaceful change of power. And if, think about this, Sam, right now. You're worried about Paul Ryan being a coward, and I agree. Paul Ryan is, in my mind, the political equivalent of the guy who sees a child who who falls into into the swimming pool and doesn't go in to save the kid. We're not talking about a raging river. I'm talking about a swimming pool. Right. And he goes, oh, yes, that's terrible. But uh, imagine that you're a very senior U.S. military officer. You're a guy who goes into the Situation Room or a woman who goes into there, and Donald Trump then orders you to do something illegal, torture people. Uh, kill somebody we have no reason to kill, um, uh, to use a nuclear weapon, to invade a country without any authorization from Congress, your legal duty is to stand up and say, uh, Mr. President, that's not a lawful order, and I cannot, under the law of military justice, uh, follow that. Trump is the kind of guy who would find an officer somewhere where he'd say, take care of him, and shoot him right in the room. Right. That's the kind of guy Donald is. Donald would never pull a trigger, but he wouldn't have any trouble doing that. And he'd say, you know, you were you were disloyal, and you were treasonous. Oh, we lost him again. Son of a. Are we dropping our uh, internet? We gotta just mark this. Bear with us, folks. Hi there. Hi. Sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll just. I mean, he is uh, so Trump is that type of person who would who who has no um, is not bound by any of our democratic norms. I guess is the That's exactly right. Donald Trump has, doesn't know what's in the Constitution. He. I mean, have you noticed no journalist has simply asked him a simple question? Uh, what section of the Constitution provides the president with his authority? Right. If you ask that, Donald would bluster his way out of it. You ask Hillary Clinton, she'll tell you right off. I'll tell you right off. Do you know, Sam? Uh, the, uh, the section three? Section? Uh, no, two. 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 All right. But, I mean, you're, you know, it, it's, it's... I was Congress, close. I was within one. You were close. Congress, president, the courts. Right. But Donald, if, if he were asked that question, instead of saying section, it's actually article... My point is he would say, well, you know, there's so many things the president can do, and there are, you know, and he would just buffalo right. his way out of it. And you're going to run for president. You know, you're not running for president, Sam. Don't you think if you're running for president, you sort of ought to read the job description? Yes. I mean, I've read the Constitution. Um, yeah. but uh, Donald has not. I assure you, Donald has not read the Constitution. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, I mean, it's clear. I mean, it's, it, it's clear the guy has no interest in, um, in, and, and and I think it's willful. I, I just think the ignorance just seems to be willful. I mean, he's. Oh, no, he, I mean, he doesn't. He wants to be dictator. L l listen to what he says he's going to do. He's going to tell corporations where to build factories. Where are the principled conservatives? And there are some. And, and surprise, surprise, National Review is one that's turned out to be principled, saying that's totally wrong. The president of the United States shouldn't tell companies where to invest their money. People who say they're conservatives, there's too much government, it's too big a government. You want to get corporations to invest here and not overseas, change the rules so that right. they do that. But you don't tell them what to do. Right. And Donald all the way through talks as if he's a dictator if he gets into office because Donald thinks that's, that's what he would be and that's what Donald thinks the president should be. Weakness to him is – well, Congress says I can't do this, so I got to do something else. I feel like all roads go back to that uh, that damn ice rink in uh, Central Park because I feel like that's where he learned his lesson. That was the big sort of the the big pivot point where he became this sort of savior who could build an ice rink, uh, for God's sakes. And uh, did you know he got paid for doing it? 
Well, I'm, I don't doubt it. I, I mean, I, I no, no. He makes every, no, no. He tells everybody if you listen to his public speeches, you know. Well, I did this as a public service to take care of all of this. He in in Libby Handros's documentary that Donald suppressed with threats of litigation, which I, you can get on iTunes and I, yeah. or somewhere on the internet. I encourage people to to download and watch. You have a party, bring people over and have popcorn. Um, the, uh, there's a guy who says, you know, I did the work on this for free because Donald said it was a pro bono project. <laughs> And Donald not only got to keep the money, but if you take your kids to the carousel near the Walman rink, Donald gets the revenue from that, too. It's in his presidential disclosure form. Public service. Give me a break here. Wow. Well, that's the last time I'm going there. Uh, David K. Johnston, thank you so much. The book is The Making of Donald Trump. Uh, we will put a link to it at, um, at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. Hey, it's Sam Cedar. Why don't you uh, subscribe to this channel? You can do so right, uh, right over here. Uh, so over. Subscri subscribe.